All right, you are ready to go. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Um, so yeah, that, like, like you said, I'm, I'm do a lot of different jobs, um, and one of them is um, I sit on the London Assembly and I sit on the Housing Committee. And I need to be very clear that although I'm billed here as part of my, you know, one of my one of the things I do is chair of the Housing Committee, I'm not always speaking as chair of the Housing Committee. I'm going to speak on the on my views on things, some of the things I've done through Mayor's Questions. I'll also speak a bit as, as some of the work I've done as a Camden councillor. So I'll try and point out where I am speaking from a cross-party point of view, because that's the thing about the committee. A lot of the work I do there is to get the Conservatives on the committee to agree to what is a cross-party view. And we do all right. I mean, they, you know, our committee's further to the left and, and further to the um, getting things done in housing that are more radical, much further than the government is. Um, and the, the Assembly as a whole is due to things like our influence. Um, but things like uh, this report, for example, which is how well the Mayor is doing on getting affordable homes, this is a cross-party view, and I can, I can say that. Um, but most of the time, and if in doubt, assume that is the case. I will be speaking as myself, as the Green Party, and as someone who stood for mayor and is going to stand for mayor again. And, and I'm trying to solve London's problems in, in that capacity, um, largely. So just to be super clear on that. Um, so I wanted to talk as quickly as I possibly could about the housing crisis in London, the problems we face, and some of the solutions that there are. Um, and this is incredibly hard to do in a short period of time because I've been going around the country as, as co-leader and quite often people want me to give a talk on, say, transport, housing. And I went to Lancaster and um, gave a talk on housing there and about, a lot of people came, about the same number as here today. And um, they asked me to speak for 20 minutes and then, like, literally 40 minutes later, I'm like, I haven't finished. There's more. There's more measures that we need to do. And I think that's, that's really important because there isn't, there are so many things wrong with the housing crisis. There isn't one big villain. There's lots of things that have gone wrong. There's lots of things that have gone wrong under every government that we've had and every council that we've had have, have made mistakes. We've got big developers doing things wrong. We've got housing associations too doing things wrong. There's not one big cause of the housing crisis. It's lots of things. And then there isn't one big solution either. Um, People tend to oversimplify the housing crisis and say we just need to build more homes and, and that will solve it. Market forces will start to work and things will get cheaper. And, and that's, not, that's oversimplifying things massively and isn't the real answer either. So it's really, really hard to go through the issues and, and talk about housing and how we solve it in a short amount of time. So I'll do my best. Um, but what I will do is if I, I'll probably talk about some things really briefly. And if I say something that piques your interest or something that you think um, you want to hear more about, then we can bring that up in questions because otherwise I genuinely will be here all day. Um, the key thing with the housing um, crisis is that the housing market as a whole, the way we organise housing, it's just got out of all sensible control. And it's been... Um, lots and lots of governments have made mistakes along the way and it's really just got worse and worse and worse and as it's got worse we haven't done enough to solve it and it's really important to remember that the housing crisis isn't just the number of people we see on the streets um, there was a really good report recently that looked at the problems there are with counting the number of people who sleep on the streets but also the people who sleep on the streets are just the tiny little tip of the iceberg they are the people who've fallen off the end of all the possible things that could go wrong in your housing situation. And there are so many people, we did a report in the Housing Committee, um, looking at the number of people who are homeless but hidden, people who are not on the streets. And you'll notice if you look at rough sleepers, and I hope you talked to lots of rough sleepers as well, that they are not women by and large, but there are women who are homeless all over London. They're just not visible on the streets. They're, they're hidden, they're spending, we found people spending all night on public transport. Um, genuinely hiding themselves away, staying with people they've just met in a way that's really unsafe, um, sleeping on other people's sofas, um, using the kindness of strangers and using up all their friendships, all their relationships, just to stay off the streets. And there are thousands and thousands of people in that position. We, we estimated 13 times more people on any one night are homeless without a home to go to, but hidden because they've got a roof over their heads or they're, they're somewhere for the night that you can't see them. Um, and those people 
are again just the tip of the, 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 the last, the next set of people who haven't quite fallen off the end yet because we've got people in precarious situations who are renters. Another thing we've looked at in the housing committee is property guardians. And these are people who live in buildings, like if this building wasn't being used, they may well be property guardians in this building. Lots of them living in um, local authority and housing association flats that are due for demolition. While there's regeneration going on, they empty out the buildings and they put property guardians into those flats um, to, to supposedly look after them. That's the phrase guardians comes out of the security industry. But this is now quickly turning into what we think is a very substandard um, legal grey area of renting that's actually not very safe, isn't giving people the rights they should have. And we did an investigation into this and now we're pushing for, for more rules through Parliament to try and protect property guardians from what can often be rogue companies. Um, and so those people are people who've been pushed out of private renting. And then the private renters themselves, even if they're not homeless, they're paying massively over the odds for their homes. The average rent in London is now double the average rent in England. Um, and it's, it's getting worse because our wages aren't going up and, and rents are going up. So there's loads of private renters who are suffering harm. They are part of the housing crisis, even though arguably they're incredibly lucky because they have got a roof over their heads. But this isn't good enough. You know, we need people to have secure housing, housing they can afford, housing they can live in for the rest of their lives. Um, and there's so many problems, and I can't go into it anymore. Um, on the, the, the bit that people usually focus on, and I like to focus on rights and, and power and affordability within the currently housed people. Um, but a lot of what people focus on is building new homes. And we do that in the London Assembly because one of the mayor's jobs is building new homes um, directly, helping to get public land um, used, helping to get TfL, um, for example, to start building homes on its, its spare land. Um, he also controls the housing grants that normally come from government. In, in London, we get the settlement from the government and we're in charge of spreading the grants around. So he, he does have specific targets for getting affordable housing built in London. So we do spend quite a lot of time holding him to account for that. And he's quite cross with us because this report we did in the London Assembly this year, um, which is the Housing Monitor, which we do once, once a year, um, we beefed it up a little bit this year and we started looking at not just how the mayor was doing compared with his targets, not just importantly how the current mayor is doing compared to the last mayor, because that's the lowest possible bar you could possibly put <laughs> in as your target. Uh, he's terribly pleased with himself, the mayor, because the number of affordable homes has gone up from you know, a really low amount, like zero, in the last year of Boris, um, to some this year. And, uh, and, and he was very cross with us for saying this, um, saying that we, we shouldn't be comparing it with just the targets. We should be comparing it with the need, because the need for affordable housing in London has shot up. If you look at the new London plan, which is currently being written, um, the amount of affordable homes as a percentage has gone up hugely because of the lag, because we've been so poor at providing it. The need doesn't go away each year. We don't get back to zero. The need we didn't fulfil the year before goes on next year's target. Um, so we are looking at needing uh, you know, over 40,000 affordable homes a year. Um, in London, and uh, the amount that the mayor's managed to fund last year was 12,500, uh, which is great. It's miles better than Boris, but it's nowhere near that need. And again, that unmet need is going to leak over into future targets, which future mayors are going to have to deal with, i.e. me. So uh, <laughs> we, were, we were very cross about it. The mayor was like, oh, these numbers are nonsense. And they're not. They are real numbers that relate to real people's needs on the ground. Um, when it comes to big developments, we all, I mean, we are in you know, ground zero of needs of not fulfilling affordable housing need. Um, you've had a Tory council in Wandsworth for a very long time not providing what you need in terms of social housing. Probably, I don't know the details, you'll have to tell me later, selling off some of the um, affordable housing and social housing, not reproviding what's lost under buy to let, and then letting big development sites go for really small amounts um, of affordable housing. One of the things I've done, and this is my work, not the, assembly, <laughs> not the Assembly's work, is this report, which looks at, um, it's called No Show Homes, which is a clever pun, um, and it's about London's missing affordable housing. And again, a lot of councils like to compare themselves with, with other councils in terms of the percentage of affordable housing each one's getting. Um, and that ranges massively across London. Um, so I've looked at all the 
all the things that have gone in since 2016, which seems a fair enough way to judge the current mayor. Um, and it ranges from, for example, um, Kensington and Chelsea Council have managed to get 2% affordable housing out of all the developers in their area. Um, and the best one, if I can find it, is, I think, Southwark. Southwark have been getting 29% of affordable housing out of their developments. These are private developers and, and, and as well as councils and housing associations since 2016. So that sounds like Southwark's doing really brilliantly. But in Kensington and Chelsea, very little development is going on. Whereas in Southwark, um, absolutely loads of, uh, affordable, of, of uh, housing development is going on. So the missing affordable homes in Southwark are... 472, whereas in Kensington and Chelsea, they are 455. So the numbers are actually very similar. And councils where a heck of a lot of building is going on, so for example, Tower Hamlets here, um, Tower Hamlets is missing over nearly, nearly 2,300 affordable homes just in three years. Um, and when I say missing, what I mean is the amount they got compared to what could have been built in the, the developments that were built compared with the target, the overall London target of 40%. So each, each borough is being measured against the Boris Johnson's original target of 40%. So there is a big difference in what's being provided versus what could have been provided in the amount of development that's going on. And for Information Wandsworth, is doing very badly on this scale. Um, they have 19% of homes that are being provided at affordable rates. And I can, I'm going to put that in front of affordable all the way through when I'm talking about this. Um, Wandsworth have managed to lose and miss 1,876 affordable homes that could have been got out of developments that have got planning permission in Wandsworth since 2016. And, and that's really poor. That's, that's quite bad as far as boroughs go. Um, so there's that. There's not getting affordable homes out of big developers. Then there's um, the absolute um, ridiculous situation of rents that are just going up and up and up and the housing costs which are going up and up and up. So I said before, rents in London are double the average for England as a whole. Um, at the moment, our housing costs are around about, the average home is around about £500,000, which is more than 10 times the average household salary. Um, and nobody can get a mortgage for more than 10 times their salary. So who is buying these homes? Well, I'll tell you, um, a lot of people who are buying these homes are buy-to-let landlords. They're people who buy them as investments. And this market, this part of the housing market, has got absolutely out of control in London in recent years. And it's not just the foreign investors doing this. It's people who are from the UK, people who are landlords who are buying them, and they've been incentivised to do this, to buy homes um, as an alternative to having a pension um, and as a, a, an investment for the future where they can make easy money just renting them out. Um, and, and I worry a lot about having these lots of these amateur landlords. I'd much rather have landlords who wanted to be landlords. Um, so there's, they often don't treat their tenants right. They often don't know the law, what their obligations are. Um, when I did a survey of private renters, I found lots of private renters had really quite ignorant landlords um, who were just wanting them to sit quietly and give them rent and make them a profit. And, and I'm not sure that's that's really what we want. Um, but also that these people are not just these buy-to-let landlords are not just buying the new homes um, and pushing down the amount of affordable and giving the big developers the incentives to, to mainly build um, market rate homes. They're also buying up existing homes as well. So we've got lots of landlords buying just normal homes, splitting them up into lots of different flats and, and, and then renting them out at really high rates. And these are often tiny flats, they're often not good. So we often complain about the, the rabbit hutches in new build homes, but actually we have to worry as much about the, the existing homes that are being bought up as well. Um, and the big developers, I think, are, are, are kind of one of the villains here because they are constantly pushing the government to relax restrictions, to not affect their viability, to keep their profitability up on these schemes. Because otherwise, who else is going to build the number of homes we need? And again, it's this focus on just providing numbers. And if you're providing, again, well, like I showed with the affordable, Missing Affordable Homes project, if you're building homes that people can't afford, if you're building homes that are too expensive for Londoners, particularly if you're building, building homes that are bought by 
not even by to let investors, but by to leave investors who don't live in them, you're not fulfilling any kind of need in London. And those, those homes are a waste of space. We shouldn't even be using our space for those homes. So we've got to get in and change things. Um, the government's also been to blame. I blame councils quite a lot now. I'm going, oh, it's all the developers and the councils. But actually, no, the government's really incentivised this. It's, it's given tax breaks to buy to let landlords. Um, it's been giving grants for just shared ownership homes. It's not been letting um, local, the, the mayor, for example, and councils around the country give their affordable housing grants out to anything that isn't a home ownership product. Um, so councils haven't been able to use housing grants to put towards council homes and the amount of ground got cut and cut and cut. And in Camden we saw in the big King's Cross development for example, which was passed by Ken Livingstone at 40% um, affordable, we were a bit unhappy about that, but it was 40% affor affordable um, and it was going to be like kind of quite decently affordable housing. Um, that got cut back at the point at which the government cut the grants. Um, and really cheekily, the developer there had managed to ring fence. I mean, this is the place where they're building Google's new headquarters. They're making an, an enormous profit out of King's Cross Railway Lands. It's the bit north of King's Cross. Um, and we'd fought and fought to get 40% affordable housing. We'd asked for more housing and less corporate HQs as well. Um, and, and when they cut the grants, they came back and they'd got this bit in the illegal agreement that said, we will provide this affordable housing, provided a, a housing provider will take it off our hands. And when... They had the grants cut. They said, look, no, no housing provider is going to want to take it off our hands because we're going to have to charge them this amount of money for these homes because the grant's been cut. And we were like, that can't be right. So we went back into the legal agreement and they'd very cleverly written what's called the Section 106 agreement to make this possible. And there was nothing we could do about it. And it was the most frustrating thing um, I've ever seen. So the government cutting the grants didn't only make it difficult for councils and things in the future, it actually affected existing planning permissions in London. That boils my blood. Right. Okay, and then even more ridiculous, we have the loss of homes and regeneration schemes. That's homes being knocked down and not replaced in estate demolitions. And that's obviously been a massive issue across London. And again, I've been following Darren Johnson, he was an Assembly member before me, getting the numbers out of the planning permissions that are being given um, and seeing what's being completed as well and just adding up the loss of, of homes through regeneration. And the numbers we've lost um, in 15 years from 2003 to 2018 across London is more than 4,000. Those have gone. They've been, and this is the net loss. These are homes that have been demolished and then in what sprung up in their place were lost. They, weren't, they didn't build more social housing. They built shared ownership, calling that affordable instead. Um, and what's in the current development database, things that already have planning permission, a lot of them passed since Sadiq Khan was mayor, um, there's another 7,000 still to be lost across London. And that's ridiculous. When we've got a housing crisis, to be having a net loss of existing council flats and social housing is an absolute travesty. So I don't know if that, that's most of the problems that there are with the housing market. <laughs> Um, give me some more questions. But yeah, so you can see that we can't solve this with one magic bullet. We can't solve it by just relaxing planning rules or letting the green belt be allowed for development. And the, the, the housing developers will come in and build all these homes and it'll all be fine and all our housing needs will be solved because they won't. It doesn't matter how much land developers get hold of or how many planning permissions they get. They're sitting on about 300,000 planning permissions around London at the moment already and they're not building at any kind of thing like that rate. Um, they, want to they want to release into the market as many homes as will keep the homes as expensive as they are now. That is their business model. Don't let anyone tell you it isn't. And their other bit part of their business model is to keep their profits high and fight and fight and fight against providing more affordable housing. So the things we have to do to fix that are really huge and there's loads of them so we have to first of all we have to fix the definition of affordable housing because when i've said the missing affordable homes these are according to the government's definition which can at the moment go up to 80 percent of current market rates in the area and that's not affordable to most people because market rates are not affordable to most people so 20 percent off not really worth it um, what we need is a proper definition of affordable, and this, these are things that the new mayor, who's not that new anymore, Sadiq Khan, have done to, ha, since he's come in that have been quite decent. He has largely fixed the definition 
of affordable. Um, it's not perfect. He's defined London affordable rent as the thing he will give grants for. He's doubled the grants he'll give to those. He's put even more in for real council homes. So there is more money now available to subsidise from our grant from the government real affordable housing and London affordable rent is defined as if I'm right a third of local uh, wages in each area and it's capped at the, the, um, the local housing allowance rate as well so just in case that there's some weirdness about wages um, being higher in the area so it is it is a decent right thing to be defining affordable as so that's his genuinely affordable homes and then he's got um, London living rent which is the next sort of step up um, and that is defined, no, I'm wrong. London living rent is defined in terms of a third of, of local average wages. And uh, London affordable rent is defined as um, much closer to social rent and as a third of like lower quartile wages or something like that. Um, so the, both these kind of work. Um, those are, there's, there's for, for people who are genuinely low income and people on average incomes can use those definitions and know that that's, that's worth having in a planning permission. He's also been made by the government to include um, shared ownership for a lot of his grants. So he's still giving away money to do shared ownership. And shared ownership, we can go into that later, is there's all kinds of problems with it. You're not much better off than a private renter, but you've got a mortgage as well, and you're responsible for all the repairs. It's like not a brilliant deal. Um, the other thing he's done is he's brought in stronger planning policies to get higher percentages out of um, developers in advance of, of trying to up that by quite a bit in the London plan as well. Um, so he is saying to developers now that you have to release all that viability information that they try, currently try and keep secret, which they use in secret to try and batter down the amount of affordable housing. He's saying, we're going to make that completely transparent and release all your figures about your development and how profitable you are, and everyone can look and see. Unless you get a 35% affordable housing in your developments, and this is according to, to my new definition as well. Um, and in order to keep their calculations and profit secret, that quite a lot of developers seem to be going along with this. So the amount of affordable housing is going up because they'd rather not tell us what their profits are. They'd rather provide more affordable housing. Now, I'm going to be asking the Mayor and Mayor's question time next week for a bit more detail about this because this is a little bit anecdotal at the moment. It's only been in since August 2017. And I want to make sure that this is really happening. And also, if it is really happening, if it's that easy for them, I want the Mayor to be putting that threshold up because 35% is not the need that we have. We need more than 50%. So I want him to say, and this would help as well with getting things, more things proposed and delivered. I want him to say, okay, 35% now. Next year it's going to be 40. And the year after that it's going to be 45. And the year after that it's going to be 50. Because <laughs> then they really would get their applications in sooner and they would start building things, actually building things. So there's that. Um, like I said, from the government, he has got some flexibility now on the grants. Um, and it is able to subsidise real social housing now. And he has got lots of public land, and this was a big thing in the mayor election in 2016, how much public land there is, how much TfL have. And this is starting to come forwards now. It is, we're three years in, and it's taken a very long time, but we are starting to see some developments on public land. Two little bits of Transport for London land have been given over to community land trusts, which I love. Um, and they're starting to look at build to rent and that's not selling off public land like has been happening before um like has happened over here am i pointing in the right direction no i'm not over there maybe <laughs> yeah okay but, but no no, no. Battersea power station for example public land sold off ridiculously um now he is trying to to get or tfl particularly are trying to keep those assets um build on them working with developers who are not the big developers but are, but are new people who want to be landlords and do builds what's called builds to rent so that's not the same as buy to rent that's build to rent and and that has potential to be decent as long as a lot of it's properly affordable um and that's the the, the next battle we'll be fighting um but things that we I'm so close to the end. This is great. Okay. So the other thing we need is we need to be not just focusing on what happens in new developments. It's kind of, you can get very obsessed with this. And I, I was just talking for far too long about that. But we need to think about getting better power and better rights over the homes that exist. 
And that is a big gap that, is, that people don't talk about enough. Um, I've definitely won some battles with the mayor on this. So on um, the homes that exist that we don't want to be demolished, which is a, a really important thing, um, I've managed working with campaigners from across London to win the right to have a ballot for residents on estates who are facing demolition. And that's a binding ballot that's written into the mayor's funding rules now. So if the mayor's going to give you funding as a council for your regeneration scheme, you have to get that through residents in a ballot. So your regeneration scheme has to be very good and it has to involve the residents and be a good deal for them. And actually, if you're dem demolishing, that's very, very hard to do. So it should help to reduce the amount of demolition overall. And where, where there is demolition, get a, a much better deal for people like the leaseholders who, leaseholders who own the homes within the, um, the, the, the estates. Um, who get a terrible deal at the moment, um, and they're they're really badly treated. So that's a big win. Um, the other win is in getting him to start looking properly at rent controls, because we can't just keep ignoring the levels of rent that are there in London. We have to do something on that. So um, more or less the first thing I did when I got elected was try and get the mayor to take some action on rent controls. He was very, he gave a really rubbish answer to me. Um, and so I took it to the London Assembly. We passed a motion that said the mayor should be trying to, to work harder and doing more to get powers off the government. Um, and then he sort of didn't, and he started to pub. He started to say he would make a London model of renting, and take that to the government and get uh, some powers devolved and a memorandum of understanding. And there was nothing about rent controls in the devolution memorandum that came between him and the government. Um, so I pestered him again and again and again. And the last time I pestered him was November Mayor's Question Time, where my question was literally, when are we going to see our mayor campaigning for rent controls? <laughs> and he was, he was the same as he's always been. And he says, oh, Sean, pat me on the head. Don't you worry. The government are not going to give us powers over rent controls. Don't be silly. Um, you know, I've got to be realistic about what the government will do. Uh, and this is exasperating. And I pointed out to him at that meeting, First of all, that rent controls are very popular amongst people. And they're surprisingly more popular um, amongst older people. When you ask the question, should there be rent controls, more older people say yes than younger people. And you'd think that wouldn't be the case. But I think the reason for that is because older people remember when there was rent control. Mm -hmm. And therefore, they think that's a realistic thing to want. Whereas younger people think it's impossible. Um, and so they're maybe not answering the question. But overall, a majority of people are in favour of having rent controls. Um, so I said that to the mayor, and he said, uh, oh, Sean, I don't just do policies because they're popular, <laughs> like the Greens. Um, and then I said, um, you, the first time we discussed this, in mayor's question time, you said to me, oh, Sean, we're not going to get rent controls, and we're not going to get the government to, to ban tenant fees. Um, but of course we did, we carried on pressing on that, and a um, bit of a cross-party thing broke out in Parliament, and they got tenis, tenants fees banned. Um, so that did happen, so let's not give up on this, let's keep pestering the government. So he went away for Christmas and he thought about this, I think, because after Christmas he, um, so just before Christmas, he com commissioned some research from YouGov to see if it was popular. And then <laughs> after Christmas, he came out with a new plan to, and he's commissioned Karen Buck, who's quite a decent MP, who got um, the Homes Fit for Human Habitation bill through as a private member's bill, which is great, it brings the right for renters in to um, so into into new legislation that so that we can sue our landlords if they don't repair our homes. And at the moment, the only recourse we have is to go under health and safety rules to the local council. And I think we all know how busy local councils are, and they're not really going and enforcing these rules. So it's a it's a it's a it's a right you have that's not enforceable until you've got the right to sue. And so we can go and get a lawyer, and we can go and get them to to fix the health hazards in our homes. So Karen Buck's done that. And he's commissioned her to go away and look at rent controls and put forward some new laws, which is very, very exciting. And the second paragraph of his press release was rent controls are very popular. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I'm very, I'm very, very pleased about that. Um, but we have to do more to improve people's rights. I want to see more rights for local communities to be able to proactively develop their areas. You have a few rights in the Neighbourhood Planning and the Localism Acts which aren't used very well. When I was selected as mayoral candidate, I put forward the idea of a people's land bank, actually empowering every community around London to look around for sites where we could build new homes. And that's like on estates, the car park maybe. <laughs> I'm a green, obviously I want to abolish the car park. Um, but, you know, other things as well. There might be um, neglected sites, industrial sites, 
places that you, you don't know who owns them, but you'd, you'd quite like to put some new homes there. Let's get these things listed. Let's find out who owns them. Let's try and get some money to buy these sites. Let's give them to community land trusts. Let's get a whole range of people developing across London. That's a really big vision for how we actually get what we need in London. And I've also been supporting the London Renters Union, um, who are something that have sprung up since the last election. Um, and I was inspired to put that into our manifesto for 2016, having talked to some local groups who are kind of working on this. And I said, that's what London is. And there's a London-wide renters' union to fight for our rights that we already have, to support people when they're facing eviction. Not many people realise how long you can hold off an eviction. They do lots of good work about that now. Um, and also fight for, for new rights as well and, and new controls and things like that. Um, and then since the election... People from Bristol who are working with a group called Acorn have come across to help. The group that we're working in Hackney have sprung into action. Uh, Generation Rent have got involved. And so now there is a London Renters Union and they're taking sign-ups. And they still need more support, um, but I'm really proud of that and we'll, we'll be helping to do that. And the other thing I'm working on is um, the London plan. So the new planning rules for London are going through. And we are there in the in the assembly, and I'm and in the examination that's going on. There's a planning inspector looking at the rules, and we all sit in the chamber where we normally sit at the London Assembly. And the, the big developers sit on one side, going, "You're never going to make these targets. You must release the green belt." And uh, we all sit on the other side, going, um, "Well, actually, we've got lots of small sites, and how can we help the boroughs to do more on the small sites?" And arguing about whether there's loopholes in the definition of affordable and it's all very legal but getting that right will be really important because that's like I don't know it's 20 years of London we can make a real difference if, even if we make a tiny difference we can make a difference there so that's all I have to say <laughs> that's actually the end of my thing um and I think it's, you know, there are so many different aspects to it and so many things that can go wrong and different boroughs are affected differently so I really want to hear from you what you're affected by in Wandsworth and hopefully I can come up with some ideas or some resources or some people you can go to to get help if you need it. Yeah. There you go. We really are very privileged. Thank you, Sean. Very <laughs> artful whistle-stop tour. Great. Okay. That's all the issues. That's all the issues that I didn't mention. <laughs> okay. Um, empty properties, yeah. Nothing's moved on in terms of new powers and rights and things like that, but they are very, very, very underused. Um, I'm seeing much more, because again, I'm going around different parts of the country now, and I'm seeing much more effort being made by councils around the country to do this. Um, quite often, like, so there's, there's one town I went to where there was one family who seemed to own one broken down house and one shop and, and also this garage at the end. And it was blighting the, the community and the community wanted these things taken up. And they were getting quite far by trying to persuade the council to buy it. But obviously buying that under a CPO is much cheaper than buying things in, on, on a London level. And it's, and it's difficult to know what to do. What I would like, my solution to this would be to write into the London plan that buy to leave is basically banned. So you get planning permission as long as one of the conditions of your planning permission is that you will write lease conditions. You're, the, you're, you're going to remain the freeholder of this site and you're, you're leasing the flats to people when you sell them. Write into the lease conditions it must be your main residence and that if it's not, then there's a penalty and it's bought at a discount back from you sort of thing so that we get we don't have to spend all the money um, and I'd really like to see that put into to planning rules um, but yeah councils could use more powers they could use more CPOs they could use more orders to bring things into into use um, and they are not doing as much as the, and for the same reason as they're not enforcing health and safety rules and they're not enforcing against bad letting agents and they're not enforcing against bad landlords and <laughs> they're just very very overstretched I think There are. I think it's about 20-something 20, I mean, 20 thousand across London, at least. Actually, Zach knows this. Zach, thank you very much. Yes. <laughs> Zach is one of our other um, London Assembly candidates, and uh, we're hoping to get him elected in a year. So he's swatting up, so you can put in all my gas. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, shared ownership is a really, really big issue. I mean, it was invented because of that 
property to mortgage ratio ratio so you buy a share of the property supposedly um, and you get a mortgage to buy that so if you think about it you go you buy one quarter say of a five hundred thousand pound flat and the flat is up is still five hundred thousand pound flat yeah you're just buying a quarter of it and then your landlord who is usually a, a housing association who quite enjoy this tenure although they were going to be investigating this later in the year in the assembly when I'm no longer chair of the housing committee we've, we've scheduled an investigation to look at this properly um, so your landlord then charges you rent for the rest of it because you're just you've bought a quarter um, and you pay service charges as if you were a, le a normal leaseholder and then if anything needs repairing you're effectively you're the homeowner so you're not like a, a council tenant who can just get so there's all kinds of problems with it and People really don't have that much security. If you stop paying your rent in the same way as you stop paying your rent if you're a private tenant, you can be fine, you know, evicted. You can take it to court and they can they can force you out. Um, and sometimes the service charges and the extra things that come forward, people overstretch themselves even to get to this point. And so people end up getting into financial trouble. And if you drop out of shared ownership, you don't really, you've hardly got any equity. So it's 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 really it's not brilliant. And it bothers me that we're subsidising the production of these things when actually I think the developers and the, the housing associations cause, can do this for nothing without subsidy and all the subsidies should be going into really affordable rent. And in terms of the things we need, um, what we really do need... I'm covering two questions. This is very cool. Um, you asked about that in terms of um, you know, why wasn't I asking for the definition of affordable to buy to be changed. It's because when you look at the need in London, the need is for affordable rent. Um, people who are on affordable rent can then do that thing of saving up and, and hoping for windfalls and legacies and things to get them onto the property ladder. But the need is there for, for affordable rent. And some of it's low-cost rent, and some of it's is intermediate. But basically, almost every home we need to build in London is, is that. There's... There's not much need for more market homes, and and I think we should be using, doing everything that's needed. Um, right, so this question about ballots is a very good question. Uh, it is the next question. So having won ballots, what we might see is people who think that they won't get a ballot passed um, try and get out of a ballot by not asking the mayor for funding, which, as you've rightly pointed out there, affects their ability to build affordable housing. So everything, that go everything that's estate regeneration has to go through the viability route. So their numbers that tell us why they're not providing affordable housing at 50%, which they should be, will be exposed. And we can look at that. And if they are trying to be giving us less than 50% affordable housing in order to get out of doing a ballot, we'll see and we'll be able to point that out. So I've got a question in to the mayor, I think. Did I put it in in the end? Because I've got to ask this question in just the right way. To the mayor, will you will you be using your planning powers to penalise councillors to not pass planning permission for things that are coming forwards without affordable homes that could be there if they took grant? And the, the new London plan is written quite well. So the requirement for public land, which is most of these regeneration schemes are, is fifty percent and sixty percent if they've got grant. And there's a requirement for them to go and get grant. So no one who tries to get out of a ballot in the way you, you say should be able to get away with it. But we'll need to look at it very closely on a case-by-case -case basis. And I now really want to look at your case in can lots I... of detail. Thank you. Please forward me the details. Sorry, can I just add to that? Because I'm a Labour councillor and that, that he came from us. Um, one story is from the charges once in the council how much affordable housing are they proposing? Is it 60%? Right.
And so, so that's that's the issue. Is mm. that, you know, the Tories are saying, "Oh, we don't care. We don't want your grants." Yeah, but I think I think they can't say that because the mayor has planning powers, and so he can just turn their planning permission down on that ground. So we need to keep very close eye on this. And also, we don't want to get to the point. We want to improve it now. We want them to take grant, and we want them to, to build 60% affordable, and we want them to do a ballot. Um, and ideally not demolish everything as well. <laughs> so, yeah, these are, these, are, these are really important cases, and please, let's, let's, let's get in touch with each other about this. Do, do they, this grant thing, sort of like if they're in partnership, your program with Stanley, that's in partnership with Taylor Wimpy. Well, like I say, the mayor's saying it has to be 60% affordable and you should be looking for grant in those circumstances. So if they're not making that, yeah. then they should be applying for grant and therefore they should be doing... <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yeah. But the other, the other difficulty we're having, aren't we, in, in, in um, following it up, is the council does it in phases. So York Road and Stanley is starting on phase zero, which is that building that's going to decamp from yeah. one house. <coughs> but as the phase as it goes along, the bi they 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 they've got three or four viability reviews for whatever portal they're saying now. Mm. So we need, we need to look in detail at this because yeah. do they have planning permission for phase zero? They probably do already. And there's no demolition involved in that, if that's the decal. Yeah, yeah. Right, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so it's the next phases that we need to look at. The mayor's, again, he's written into his funding guidance and the rules for the regeneration. Don't try and split up your things into phases, because I'll see straight through that, effectively. So, <laughs> we, should, we should be able to see that. But, yeah, they've done... Westminster Council are doing the same with an estate um, off Kensington... Is that... No, hang on. Is it Kensington and Chelsea Council? Is Ebury? Which council is that? Yeah. Which oh, it's, it's it's Westminster Council, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's Ebury Bridge Estate. Okay. Don't don't film the man from Ebury. <laughs> 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 this is. Yeah. 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 Yeah
across different parts of London as well um, and having children and, and it's just been yeah just been a complete nightmare for her um, so yeah we will have some some recommendations um, that I don't know whether I can get cancel all benefit cuts past the Conservatives on the committee um, but we will be doing our best um, the level of crisis payments is something I've not tackled because I don't uh, it, it's confusing, but I'm an assembly member and a councillor, and generally when people have those kinds of casework issues, they go to their MP, who tends to deal with the DWP. So I've not dealt with that yet, and I um, would be interested to know more. One thing that I've seen this week has been published by New Economics Foundation is an excellent bit, bit of proposal that's a step towards a basic income, which basically involves abolishing the tax-free allowance and giving everybody the cash instead so i don't know most people have a tax free allowance of about eleven thousand pounds a year and i think that gives you about 50 quid a week um in free cash instead of a cash tax free allowance so everything you earn you do pay tax on so we'd all pay more tax but if you're on a lower income you'd be better off than than before if you're on a higher income and also anyone who's not working would also get the cash that's the whole point so this is 48 pounds a week that you can have no matter what, even if universal credit is late, that's your tax-free allowance. And then the people who are better off, because you start paying tax on all your income, they start paying the higher rate of tax at a, at a lower income. And so we get more, more money off people who are earning more than, I can't remember what it is, 30-something thousand pounds a year. So it's all the above-average people end up a little bit worse off. Um, but not by very much, and in proportion to how much more than that you earn, um, you're, everyone gets the first. And it's just a great proposal. Look it up. Um, never put it forward. It's, a, it's revenue neutral, as you can tell. Um, we're just converting what we currently give away in tax allowances into cash. But everyone's again then getting some cash, and that's brilliant. And that would be take the form of just that kind of insurance, that crisis payment thing, when no one's destitute. Well, you're quite destitute at £48 a week, but you are not completely destitute. You've at least that got that to rely on. I think that's a really good step in the right direction. Obviously, we want basic income at a proper level for all. But if we can prove that this works, that would be amazing. Um, How much do you say? How much is our basic income? We're working on that too, because we've got it. we're working on a manifesto for the national elections, and we do need to know what we want to be putting forward in terms of next steps on basic income too but that one's a great one from NAF I love them um the question about regulated return on investments you're talking about profit cap essentially yeah yeah yeah, yeah. and it is it is frustrating because when these I mean at the moment the the main moves on viability assessments has been for transparency and for changing the amount we let you pay for land so one of the bits of profitability is how much you pay for the land um, and we're and, and we're saying that that you shouldn't be paying more than its current use value plus a little bit plus a little bit more um, and a lot of people have been paying a lot more because you if you've got a bit of land that can be developed you can say to whoever wants to buy it well you can build 55 luxury flats on this land so i want a bit more than its current use value plus 10 but but then we're trying to not allow for that in, in viability assessments at the moment but profits are still there at something like 20 percent, and they're totally like the profits you're allowed to make um and i think potentially we could be bringing that down because i know a lot of a lot of people who want to build homes who don't want to make a huge profit. In fact, they're very patient about the profits they want to make. They want to be, like I said, landlords. They're quite happy to invest lots of money and make three, four percent in a you know a year in rents back, and also invest some of that back in to repairs. And you know they're quite happy to just gently get their money back because they own the asset that they've built in the first place. So I think there's there's real potential to, to do that, to start re restricting what profits we allow for in, in viability assessments, certainly, um, which is not banning profits, it's just saying we change what's reasonable. Um, now, this is a really interesting point about... Um, the different pressures in outer and inner London towards conversion or deconversion. Because I have, um, my, my council ward is Highgate Ward, which is near to the Heath and, and quite desirable. And we have several streets that for, for lots of years were broken up into lots of flats and were kind of like, you know, a bit run down and affordable and bohemian. And lots of people moved in who were artists and poets and things like that. And it's because it's near the Heath and it's lovely and they like to swim. 
Um, and then gradually these people got richer and richer and they started buying more and more of the flats that were also in their houses and converting them into bigger and bigger houses. And now we have a street where um, we've got many bankers whose names I don't know, but also Ed Miliband and Benedict Cumberbatch living on the same street. And their houses are now just big, one big house and they're all trying to build basements and extra things. And I don't remember that Ed Miliband... Um, had a photo taken in his kitchen. Everyone was like, that's not your kitchen. And he went, oh, yeah, it's my other kitchen. <laughs> sorry. So, sorry, that's, I'm not having to get a bit of But, yeah, these are big houses. And then, so the pressure in Highgate is for deconversion. And so in our neighbourhood plan, we've put in a policy against conversions. Whereas, um, sorry, against deconversion. So to keep the flats built up. But like you say, in outer London, a lot of people are seeing a two-bed semi and then converting it into five supposedly separate flats and breaking the rules on what's an HMO. And again, who who enforces the rules on what's an HMO? The council. So there you go. Yeah. Who, who've got to do all the planning enforcement? Um, and we have the same problem in Camden. So that's, yeah, we need to do more. I think one of the things a mayor can do is a lot more help for councils to do enforcement. But clarity in these rules would be really helpful. And like you say, there's this mismatch and it's, yeah, so let's, let's try and change that. Yes, okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, this is the viability assessment thing. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, I'm trying to remember the, the website. Um, but there, there are genuinely people out there who advertise themselves as consultants who specialise in arguing down affordable housing using viability assessments. Um, and there's all kinds of tricks and, and things. But, yeah, just that literally, you're allowed to make 20% profit on whatever you're building um and that's you know all that's taking away your you know, all the salaries your, your salary comes off as well you know all the sort of on costs and all the things and all these consultants are being paid huge amounts and then you'll pay your planning consultants to get it through the council and again council planning officers have a lot of trouble standing up to planning consultants who argue that things are, are wrong all that comes up it's just still 20 percent profit at the end of it um and i you know I'm, I'm much keener to try and diversify the housing market get away from developers who want to pile in, make a quick profit and go away. They're also, the part of that business model is also to pre-sell the flats in, and in foreign markets largely, <laughs> getting people to buy them off plan and say they'll buy them because then that's some guaranteed income that reduces their risks and they're, they're happy. But that chunk that they sell, they're the ones that end up empty. They're the ones that end up with you know poor absent landlords and all of that and, and it helps to push up the price. So I think we've got to get away from the people who, who operate that business model and into people who genuinely want to be long-term landlords, renting to a big, big chunk of their homes at affordable rates. And some of those people are councils, some are housing associations, they're really up for this. But I think there are also some sort of private landlords and, and pension funds and people like that who are patient about their profits, who we should be incentivizing. And the more restrictions, the more of a, of, of a fierce bottom line we put on what our requirements are in the, in the London plan, the more we'll be creating a level playing field for those people. So the thing about the profit caps and that, you know, the more we create space for other people to enter the market because they're not having to compete with absolute sharks. So, yeah, it's, it's I don't know, it's difficult to, to talk about. I should probably get some diagrams of, of the, the new entrants. The things like community-led housing, if they're forced to bid for a bit of land that they just want to build on and live on and they're not going to make a profit because they don't want to make a profit, they just want to build on it and live on there as a co-op, then they can't be competing to buy that land with a big developer or even a medium-sized developer who wants to, to flip it around for profit. Or worse, buy it, get planning permission for something, and then sell it without building anything at all. That happens an awful lot. And then the next person who buys it probably wants to change the planning permission to make it even worse, to make it, and then they might just sell it with that new planning permission. A lot of things are not getting built because of land speculation. I want developers who actually want to build. And again, the thing about people who want to build to rent is they're incentivized to build as soon as possible and start collecting rent, whereas the, the big developers are not. And, and that's a real problem. So in terms of, very quickly, in terms of planning and all that, we are keeping the zero carbon homes requirement in the London plan and there's going to be an argument about that. 
and they are the, the, the developers are, are, don't want to do it it hasn't been government regulations up to now when we wrote the London plan but at the moment we're, we're sticking by that so for new homes we will be building zero carbon homes for the older homes this has been a problem ever since I joined the Green Party one of the first things I got and I was talking to Jean Lambert who's our MEP at um, the, the do where she um, published her new book which is looking back on 20 years and the best report she ever did the one I used the most was the one that looked at the the need for retrofit the the cold and expensive and, and the fuel poverty and, and the, the bad insulation on London homes because we've got so many homes that are badly insulated and need retrofit um, and this was in 2004 that she published this report and we've made virtually no progress since then in retrofit some councils have done reasonably well out of the eco grants that, that were going around from the, the energy companies um, I know Camden was quite good at sucking up <coughs> quite a few of those and luckily we've been doing our insulation not using cladding we've We've, we, we have famously on four blocks, to be honest, under a PFI scheme, um, and we had to evacuate those blocks when this was discovered. Um, but a lot of our blocks and, and um, council homes and care homes particularly, I think we focused on places where the most vulnerable live, have been clad in um, just, just render and rock wool, and that's been really good, and they've, they're much improved. Um, but no, there's all that stuff's running out. All that stuff's going and, and gone, and so... And the mayor doesn't have funding streams where they can get lots more money. So we are going to be... There's a comprehensive spending review about to happen at the government level, and we're all going to gang up on them. Everybody, the Green Party, hopefully the Labour Party, if they're supporting Green New Deal now, because it's a key part of the Green New Deal. Um, hopefully the mayor, hopefully the assembly and the committees will all be writing in and going, if there's one thing you should be investing in, it's home energy efficiency, because it's jobs all around the country... Um, it saves money. It saves more money than you spend on it in, in not too long a time. Um, it's, it's the best thing we can possibly do. So that's going to the government to say, get, get on with this. But open spaces are, yeah. Open spaces and nights are also terribly important. Yes, now I'm not an expert on this, so we may need to consult offline about what it says in the London plan but I know CPR have been doing some work on this and it's completely true King's Cross you know I don't know if that's my, my big example of a big development but um, if you go north of King's Cross station and there's that swing and you're on the way to um, St Pancras International then there's it's 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 quality open space that everybody loves that was all full of sun in the in the architect's diagrams <laughs> is completely surrounded by um, 10 and 11 floor buildings that are, that are office buildings to the extent where it basically has no sun it's freezing, it's freezing it's, it, even in springtime and you can't really sit in it um, it looks nice but it's never sunlit and it's one of those things that, that probably doesn't get considered enough I did have a problem with um, one very detailed thing about the light rules um, so taking light away from people is a planning issue and you shouldn't be doing it but it, if it applies to parks or not, I don't know. But if you're taking light away from someone's windows, I had a development that was far too close to some existing homes in my in my ward, and we worked. We looked at the light figures in the light report, and it said that the people on the ground floor, who were mostly obviously older people who spend a lot of time in, because they're, they're that's the people who are on the ground floor. This is council blocks. Um, were going to have like th a third of their light taken away and we were saying that wasn't acceptable particularly if, for people who spend a lot of time in those homes and need the sunlight and the conclusion according to like the planning rules of the light report was well because they didn't have much light anyway 30 percent wasn't that much of a reduction if that does that mean that <laughs> so there's something wrong in the actual assessments that are mu that are much more sort of at a at a guidance level that needs to be sorted out now. And I think we should be applying them also to open spaces because they never draw them in, in the rain, in the architect's plans. And they don't really do the, the shade properly either, I don't think. Certainly Waltham, Walthamstow, the town square there, they're building big buildings, big tall buildings around it. And people did some quite good work to try and show how much it was going to be not a nice place to be anymore. But it still got through. So, um, I was wondering whether this is something that the mayor might look at calling in if, if it goes against any local plan, London plan, whether there's any... That's a good question. I don't, things have to qualify to be a certain 
size or impact for the mayor to call it in. So I don't know if he can. Anyone here, a planning expert, <laughs> can turn no. out? I don't know. Um, if he could, then he might well call something like that in. Um, I the, the, the closest parallel I can think of is the Queen Street residents who are trying to fight off the Mamma Mia experience. Yeah. Do you know about this? Okay, so this is on the South Bank, and Queen Street is a, is a co-op, it's an ancient old co-op, um, and um, on part of their land, and it was, a, the Queen Street sort of management were quite keen on this, because it's a bit of land they, were, they weren't going to build on for a while, and ABBA came and um, said, we, ha we love Mamma Mia, our musical, and what we want to create is essentially a night out around themed around it, where you eat and drink and sing along and every and everyone in the area, which is a quiet residential area, <laughs> was like, okay, that's like three, you know, three hundred you know, parties of people who are here to get very drunk and they're gonna spill out into our area and, and that. So they fought it off. So just say it can be done. If if it's a quite an alien thing that's to, I mean if this would this would never get turned down on Camden High Street. But it sounds like you might be able like Putney High Street might be possible. Um, if this isn't how your area normally is. So, and also there's, I mean, there's licensing questions as well. One thing you might try and do is say, well, okay, it can go ahead, but we want these licensing restrictions on it. And then if you make those really mean, like close at 11 and things, then they, then they won't. You say, okay, fine, but they have to close at 11. But that's more dangerous because obviously they can keep appealing those, plan those, li those licensing things. But I would say... Go, I would say look up the Queen Street because Queen Street are very good at documenting what they do and they had a victory so Google that Google, Google Queen Street Abra I think it's called Abra Experience I don't know um, Mamma Mia Mamma Mia the, the Night Out or so, I can't remember but it was Mamma Mia something and uh, Google that and see what, they, what arguments they used because it sounds like a very similar thing um, and I don't know if the mayor can call it in or not you'd have to get a planning expert to tell you ask the council's planning officer Yes. So in general, we're quite in favour of that, but in the right place. So yeah, we want the end of the nighttime economy to thrive. Events going on as well as the night out in London shouldn't be totally about drinking and eating, eating, and drinking, drinking and eating, but there should be a lot of yeah. cultural and artistic. I mean, we like nightlife. We like nightclubs, but we want them in you know nightlife areas, not in areas that are not like nightlife areas. areas. <laughs> yeah. Okay, there you go. But anyone, any more planning casework? Uh, okay, well, we've been going for an hour 25 minutes. I think it's probably time to wrap up. Would you like to make any closing remarks? Yes. Um, I would like to say thank you for indulging me my and my desire to talk about planning issues constantly because I'm... This, I mean, this is genuinely my bread and butter work. A lot of my work in, in the council is... And we, we're Highgate, so we have quite active residents who oppose things or want to change things. We also have a neighbour plan where we're proactively proposing things. And so I quite get quite involved in the detail of those plans. And at a London level, in the London Assembly, what I'm trying to do is spot the problems that there are and fix those at a policy level so that nobody has to go through that again. <laughs> and we can actually just fi you know, fix the actual thing that's wrong. Um, but also my job as an assembly member is to get involved in, in local planning things. But I can't do it as much as I would like. And quite often it's just the best thing I, try, the thing I try and do is get on the phone with somebody and give them 10 minutes of advice. Because putting things in writing takes ages and, and, and it's just much better to have a chat. So it's just great to be able to do that here. But more importantly than that, um, I want to say thank you to everybody who's delivering these. Because this is part one of our campaign to do even better than we have done in the last two elections where we've been growing our vote share and we've been growing our um, success in the mayor elections for next year's election to get more assembly members elected. And um, we, did, we had a really good poll today um, that was a nationwide poll but showed us going up to 6%, um, which is the first time I've seen that in a while. And this is under first past the post. And here in London we have 
um, a PR part of the election for the Assembly. We've always had at least two Greens. We think we can get Zach at the back elected to um, the third place at least. And we've got Ben Ali in our fourth place, who's a fantastic councillor, a candidate who was almost a councillor in Islington to, to keep Caroline Russell um, company, but was 75 votes short. But he, he really needs to be elected somewhere. So we've got to get out now, get in a year early and start delivering and start letting people know what Green Assembly members do. So thank you to everybody who is going to go to a door with this slightly flimsy leaflet, which I apologise for. I deliver a lot of leaflets and I like them to be solid. <laughs> I, like, I like them a little bit heavier weight than this so that they go nicely through the letterbox. But if you do that, they'll go through all right and it'll be fine. So thank you to everyone who's doing that. Um, and what we'll be doing in the next sort of six months or so is trying to put together an even better manifesto than last time um, because we came with a big panel of good ideas to put forwards for, for how London should be different and we've got several of them through so for one thing we need good ideas to replace those ones but there are also new challenges that London's facing some things have got worse some things have got better and we want to make sure we've got the best possible set of ideas so there will be an, an event organized where we we get together and we we come up with new ideas for our manifesto and we start thinking about how we can campaign for them in advance of the election because we've got over a year to go um, and we're in such good shape and I think we're going to do really well so that's all I wanted to say bit of a pet talk but deliver delivering these is step one to great success so please go out and do it <laughs> I think we Oh, money as well, yeah, sorry. <laughs> I'm just now going to plug my crowdfunder, which I totally forgot to do. Um, we, we need a campaign manager for a year from the election this time. We had a, a campaign manager for seven months last time, and we did brilliantly, and he was amazing. Um, but we need to recruit somebody good, and we need to do it from the 7th of May this year. And we're currently crowdfunding for that. Um, we have got more than a third of our target in less than a third of the days. So we're very happy. And almost all the donations are small, which is amazing, because actually well, that's what we want. We're not, we're not going to get a big donor. We need to get a lot of small people-powered donations. So the key thing about that is, if you've given your tenor, brilliant, but you, we need to pass on the message so that more people can give us a tenor. So please share the crowdfunder. You'll look on my timeline, you'll find plenty of tweets promoting it um, and share it on Facebook as well because yeah genuinely the more people you spread it to and say like a tenner each is about what people are giving and that's adding up to a lot so far and it'll keep doing that if you keep sharing it so thank you thank you, thank you for managing me